FSN Radio. It's all about what's next. Go to FinancialSurvivalNetwork.com and sign up for your free weekly newsletter. You'll also get three free reports. The Financial Survival Network. It's all about what's next. Welcome, and you are listening to the Financial Survival Network. I'm Kerry Lutz. It's 2-21-18. So, keeping an open mind, critical thought, essential to survive and to thrive in this new economy, in this new world. If you don't have an open mind, if you're closed off to ideas that are contrary to your own, well, then you wind up like a bunch of crazy liberals marching on state capitals manipulating children to do your dirty work when you don't really know what you are talking about. Well, without getting into that, because we'll do a triple let's report on it later. Hey, as always, <laughs> participate in the show. Send us an email to kl at com. So critical open mind, critical thought. That is what was the core of a liberal arts education many, many years ago, many, many moons ago, if that's not politically incorrect. I mean, people used to go do liberal arts and then they could literally take on any job. But for some reason that is no longer, well, somebody who is always open-minded and a good friend of the show, Steve St. Angelo, SRS Rocco Report. And Steve, welcome back on. Thanks, Kerry. Yeah, we've uh, had some interesting uh, uh, things happening in all these different markets, the stock market, the crypto market. So there's plenty to uh, plenty to talk about. Uh, so so this concept of the critical mind, the open mind that is able to take on new concepts to actually balance two opposing viewpoints at once and not have cognitive dissonance or meltdown. It seems to be uh, in scarce supply these days, doesn't it? Yes, and uh, the the issue is to I, I, I was able to spend a summer with one of the, uh, the one of the four men credited putting the man on the moon, and I believe the man went on the moon. There's there's conspiracies that we didn't go, <laughs> but sure. uh, the issue is this this top engineer he said two important things: learn how to do as much as yourself and get to the root to the pro- of the problem. Now, uh, most analysts or most analysis takes other information or superficial information and comes up with, uh, let's say, a solution or a forecast or their their opinion. And the problem is you, you, you don't dig deep enough. Now, uh, what I've been trying to look at in the market is the energy. While the energy uh, has done some things that I did not see in, in, the, in the beginning, this does not mean the underlying fundamental of the, the problem with energy going forward isn't still there. What we've done is we've done a lot of things, let's say, to uh, offset it. And so it's kind of like the debt. You could add a lot of debt and you can continue business as usual, but this is not sustainable. So, Kerry, the important thing is uh, where I differ with most analysts that specialize on, let's say, the healthcare industry or the housing market, the automobile industry or the tech industry. And then the, and there's some that just focus on the energy industry. Well, the important thing, all those industries are worthless without the energy industry. So when you, you've got to focus on the energy first, and when you understand what's happening with energy, you can see the the problems and what's going to, what's going to occur in the future. Hey, well, you know, perfect example of there not being an energy payoff is ethanol, corn-based ethanol, sugar-based, different story. Uh, Corn-based ethanol is a perfect example of something that should not be used as a motor fuel because the energy expenditure between growing the corn and then fermenting it in the tanks and all that and then shipping it to the refinery and the blending process that has to take place that is problematical is, is really... It just makes it bad as a motor fuel. But yet, politics being what it is, we wind up with something that is a net loser. Oh, and not to mention the BTU per gallon uh, is is way, way below petroleum. And yet here we are generating uh, billions of gallons of ethanol a year to make the farm states happy. 
That's correct. And I, I've seen different numbers. I've seen 1.2 to 1, uh, to 1. 1.8 or 1.8 or 2 energy return on investment of corn. What you put in, then you get, uh, you put one in and you get 1.2 to 2 out. Uh, and I, I think the range is somewhere in the middle. But the problem is, Kerry, our modern society, the United States, needs an energy return on investment of its oil of, of above 10 we need 12 to or 15 to 1 to run everything and so when you can't do that then you start adding debt and and since the energy return on investment for the US fell below 30 to 1 in the 70s and now there are different numbers. Shale comes in about five to one. It's probably less than that now, even though it seems like it's more efficient. Even The problem is the uh, U.S. agricultural system, our food system, let's call it our food production system, from planting, harvesting, processing, distribution. If you're going to grow an ounce, uh, if you're going to put one calorie of energy in, a, in, in corn, you have to burn 10 calories of energy to produce one calorie of corn that gets on your dinner plate. So it's a net energy loser. And that's the issue. It wasn't a problem when our energy return on investment was above the 10 or 15. When it was 30, it was fine. Now it's below that that number, that 10, that's when we're seeing all these problems of debt and derivatives. Uh, it's the, it's actually the energy. The energy is the problem, and we're trying to offset it with all these uh, monetary, political, and economic uh, band-aids. So your thesis here, if I've got it right, is that everything we're going through now, all of the uh, problems, economic problems, debt, et cetera, all stem from not being able to get a high enough return on our energy investment. That's correct. Uh, and it, it, the same thing with the Roman Empire. The Roman Empire, uh, the ancient Roman Empire expanded uh, based upon taking energy, putting it into their legions, their uh, forces, and then they would conquer other uh, properties, other regions, other states. They would acquire their resources and they would continue to do that. And th it was a very h high energy return on investment of the expansion of the Roman Empire. But but when they expanded to a certain degree that they couldn't, it, it was it was so hard to maintain what they had that it was it was impossible to expand any further. So when they had to rely upon their farming energy return on investment, which is five to one, human labor ERI is five to one, it couldn't support all their massive uh, uh, facilities, the defense, their forts, all their legions, and even the, all the the million of people that was in ancient Rome uh, to support that system. That's the reason why they collapsed. So we're seeing the same thing with the modern, with the U.S. and the modern uh, society we have today. The problem is the Roman Empire didn't acquire a lot of debt. They debased their denarius, their Roman right. currency. But they didn't acquire a lot of debt. We've debased our dollar as well as most Western countries and Eastern countries have debased their currency. We've also added a lot of debt and derivatives. So it's like a triple whammy. And so it'll come down much quicker than it did with the, with the ancient Roman Empire. Really think so, huh? Well, so what about nuclear energy? I mean, that theoretically uh, is the best of all of them, isn't it? Nuclear energy, in, back in the 50s, it was advertised as being too cheap to meter. Yeah, I remember. The issue, the issue with nuclear, the problem with all these things are getting to the root of the problem. When you have to consider what do you do with all that nuclear waste, all the uh, radioactive waste, how you decommission a plant and how long it takes to decommission that plant, and not only the money, because we have to remember, Carrie, Money is from burning energy. That's where you get money from, burning energy. And so it, it takes a lot of energy, a lot of money, a lot of capital to decommission one nuclear power plant over a decade or more. We never considered that in the energy return on investment calculation. So unfortunately, nuclear, and there's there's other uh, technology of like uh, the, the thorium, Unfortunately, the energy return on investment is still too low. And we have to remember our whole society isn't run on electricity. It's run on liquid fuels. 
our whole transportation system, all our just-in-time inventory of food, goods, products, it's all based on just-in-time. And that is that only works on liquid fuels, not electricity. So even if we have a solution for electricity, you still have to mine all the materials, transport all the materials to build these thorium reactors. And it's still it's still not a, a viable solution long term. Yeah, I see what you're saying. And hey, up next, we're going to talk more about energy, more about precious metals and the things you want to hear about. But for right now, I've got this podcast I want you to listen to. FSN Radio. It's all about what's next. Are you a highly paid professional, a doctor, a lawyer, or an engineer? Well, here's a podcast for you. It's called Wealth Formula Podcast, and you'll find it at wealthformula.com. Robert Kiyosaki, Jim Rickards, Fannie Mae Chief Economist, Doug Duncan. They're just a few of the recent guests on this podcast that I'd like to recommend you try out. Wealth Formula Podcast is a really unique show, and it's great if you're looking to build generational wealth. The host, Buck Joffrey, was a guest on this show. He's an ex-surgeon who retired and is now an entrepreneur and investor with a focus on peeling back the secrets of the ultra-wealthy. It's a great show for professionals and entrepreneurs. Check it out. You'll find it at wealthformula.com. Podcast is available on the usual platforms like iTunes, Stitcher, or just Google it. Wealth Formula Podcast. The Financial Survival Network. It's all about what's next. All right. So, Steve, we're back now and talking about energy. So is there any form of energy out there? that is economically viable because it's not just the U.S. that's facing this issue. It's the entire world. So there are places where your energy return on investment is in that 30 range, but it's going down all over the world. They're, they pump the whole ocean of salt water into Saudi Arabia's largest oil field to keep it producing. Uh, what do we have on the horizon that can help ameliorate this or is it just going to be disaster? The simple answer to that, it's a, we, we have no plan B. We've designed a whole infrastructure based on liquid fuels. Anytime you, you want to, if, let's say you don't like the building that you're in, you got to tear it down and you've got to re, you have to re, rebuild the whole thing. So to tear down and rebuild a different infrastructure, the costs, the energy costs are just off the charts. If we, if we wanted to do this, Kerry, we should have done it decades, decades ago. Now, the problem is you mentioned Saudi Arabia. People say, well, you know, the Saudis have all this spare capacity. Well, what's amazing about what's happening in Saudi Arabia, even though the U.S. shale oil industry is in serious trouble, they have, they have so much debt, it wasn't profitable. People say, well, there's, they're more efficient. The costs have fallen. In, to, in certain degrees, that's true. But they've taken OPM, other people's money, and they they've produced all this oil and they owe that money to these to these investors and they're never going to get their money back. Most of it, they won't get it back. So that's a Ponzi scheme. And when they continue to get offer new senior notes, we're starting to see a lot of these companies like Continental uh, Marathon. They're adding uh, offering a billion dollar in new senior notes. Why are they doing that? Because they don't have the profits to pay off the billion dollars they owe right now. And so they have to bring in new money to pay off old money. And that's the typical typical definition of a Ponzi scheme. But the Saudi Arabia cut production in 1980s by 5 million barrels a day. They were able to do that. During the, the uh, 2009 uh, collapse, the uh, economic crash and collapse, Saudi Arabia cut a million barrels a day. They could cut a million. Now they're down, they've cut 350,000 and they're hemming and hawing about another 50,000 barrel decrease. They can't cut too much because their costs have increased as well since the 80s. They're not making a lot of money. So for them to cut, they can't cut a million, two, three million. It would totally hurt, destroy them. So everybody is producing as much oil as they can, not because we have all this oil, because it's costing so much more now. There isn't a lot of profit there. And they have all these commitments and debt. This is the issue that we're facing now. Mm -hmm. Interesting. So 
So there's no hope here. Is that what you're trying to tell me? I just can't believe that. What if tomorrow we get the most efficient solar cells in the history of humanity and you know, we're able to store this energy and all of this or electric cars. There's no no option here available. Let me say this. There's never a never. But when you look at past examples of empires and civilizations in the past, how many have come and gone? Yeah. All, all, all of them. Yeah, well, <laughs> they all peaked true. and declined. Now, we we tapped into some very uh, for some very, I mean, uh, high, uh, very high energy return on investment oil, natural gas and coal. Uh, the the past civilizations didn't tap into these these high quality energy sources, and they've only been around for you know 150 200 years for coal and 100 and so years yeah. for uh, oil and natural gas. So the the issue is, I'm not saying there's no solution, but if we look at history, if we look at the falling energy return on investment. And we see the falling, the, the infrastructure in the U.S. is, is falling apart. The uh, U.S. Uh, Eng- Society of Engineers gave the U.S. a D-plus rating of their infrastructure. So it's not an F. It's not a failing grade. And we are better than a lot of third world countries. But the problem is it takes a lot of energy carry to make, just to maintain all that. The more you build, the more you have to maintain. And it's it was fine to build it with a 30 to 1 energy return on investment. But it's becoming impossible to sustain it on a five to one. So the issue is, I think we're we are going to see a more rapid disintegration of the energy industries. I'm not saying it's going to happen this month or next year, but over the next two, three to ten years, we 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 will see serious dislocations, and it will be due to the energy because we have to remember, it's one thing to have all this debt. But you have to service that debt, and you can only do that if you increase oil production. Now, we all know oil production will peak, and it's peaked in many countries. It's peaked in many countries. This is an anomaly for the United States with this shale because it's not profitable. But when oil production starts to decline globally, you can't maintain all the leverage and the debt. So it's a whole different economic reality and economic economy at that point in time. And so that's the reason why I see gold and silver are two of the few assets that will prosper during that that transition. So what about natural gas? So you might not get the return from oil because those fractures close up and you're limited to how big a pool of oil you can take from each well and you have to keep digging new wells, diminishing marginal returns. However, you don't have that that situation with nat gas. Uh, it doesn't clog up the fracks. Once you dig a nat gas well, then it just keeps going and going, which is why we've got tens of thousands of them shut in right now, because the price of nat gas is too low. And when you have wet gas, as opposed to dry gas, wet gas having all the, what they call, uh, case head gasoline, natural gasoline, they call it. You know, when you've got that, uh, you know, the nat gas, we got hundreds of years supply of it. Well, according to Art Berman, uh, and he's a more, let's say, he's he's a pretty good, uh, I would say he's more mainstream. You'll see his work on Forbes, but he's also more, a little bit of alternative. Um, there, is, uh, there is 100 years of technically recoverable natural gas, but economic economic natural gas th- that's a whole different story there's there's not a hundred years it, it might be it might be 10 or 12 or 15 years it's it's a, it's a fraction of that the issue is natural gas is a good energy source but again transportation 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 UPS runs right where I live runs trucks on natural gas right but they're much more expensive they're much more expensive less B again it yeah, yes. And so if you the more technology carry you throw at something, the more the energy return on investment falls. Technology doesn't increase the energy return on investment. It lowers it. Yes. So but you can access more lower quality energy and that we have done that. The problem is to use uh, natural gas as a transportation fuel. It won't scale. 
in the time that we need it. And I also believe we do not have we do not have 100 years of, of natural gas supply. We, we have a lot less than that. Uh, we could we could we could debate over how much, but it's what is economic to produce. And uh, I think the issue is we're not realizing there's a lot of debt out there. The debt is kind of holding up all the prices of assets. When the debt collapses, so would the prices of assets. Even though uh, the price of oil might be a a dollar fifty a gallon, a uh, price of gasoline might be a dollar fifty a gallon. If if half the people don't have a job, I'm not, I'm just saying, you can't even afford the dollar fifty in gasoline. So there is there is this uh, there is this let's say an option that we have a huge deflation. We could have hyperinflation, but we have huge deflation where people, even though the prices are falling, they can't even afford to buy them. Right. Because there aren't the jobs. So uh, I'm not trying to paint such a negative picture, but we're setting up and uh, I'm going to do some more videos on my YouTube channel about what's happening in the U.S. shale oil industry. And it's a lot more negative than what the market realizes because the investor relations presentations are providing a very positive spin, but the reality is a lot more negative. When you start to look at the whole situation, uh, the costs, the debt, uh, I I think we're going to see a huge turnaround. Uh, And again, let me just conclude with this. U.S. oil production took 23 years to double from 5 million barrels a day in 1947 to 10 million barrels in 1970. It's only taken seven to eight years to double that this time. Now we can we can smack ourselves on the back and say that was that was great, but we must understand charts and trends. What goes up quick comes down quick. Nothing that goes up at a, at a huge angle stays up there. So uh, we Bitcoin. have to understand. <laughs> not even Bitcoin. <laughs> not. Not even Bitcoin. So I, I believe we're going to see a, over the next several years, we're going to see a rapid collapse of U.S. shale oil production. Well, we're seeing it in North Dakota already. Uh, you know, the production, they just can't drill enough holes to keep the production going. Haven't seen it in the Permian Basin and in other places in the southern half of the U.S., but certainly it's possible. And then what's next here? I mean, there just aren't that many sources of conventional oil, you know, loose oil, whatever they call it. These are tight supplies, loose supplies, just not there. So then the price skyrockets, huh? Well, according to thermodynamics, uh, a a couple of gentlemen uh, in the Hills Group and uh, I look at it as a trend. I don't look at it as a precise indicator. The, the Actually, the price of oil may continue to trend lower because we have to remember if we if we take out all the money printing and all the debt, if we could remove that, what's the real price of, 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 of oil or corn or, or anything? We, we don't know because there's so much debt propping everything up. So th- there is an alternative that the price doesn't skyrocket, the price will continue lower because it's not worth it. The oil price, it takes so much to produce it. It's it, the, en- the energy quality isn't there. You, you don't want to spend a lot of money on it. The market does not want to p- spend that much. And if people are losing jobs when this market crashes, and it will, it's too much leverage in it. When the, when the market crashes, what happens to the oil price? It falls. And that's what happened in 2009. The oil price went from 147 down to, to $28, $30. Now, it came back up. Why? Because the U.S. government, Federal Reserve, and the Treasury propped everything up. Very true. So when you, when you, when you prop things up, you uh, add a lot, of, a lot of inflation, the price moves up, and then you're able to access lower quality oil. I think that was a one-time, that was a one-time get out of jail free card. I don't, I don't see that being sustainable or being used over and over again. Uh, and so that's why I think this next go around, the Federal Reserve and the Treasury, by printing money, it, it's not going to work like it did in 2009 and onwards. Right. Gotcha. All right. Well, hey, 
what you're saying makes a lot of sense. There's definitely a logical argument to it. I know Chris Mortensen's been saying uh, a lot of similar things to you. And obviously, we're just going to allow the crisis to unfold. There's no forward thinking here. There's nobody sounding the alarm, is there? No, I, and I, that's the problem. We weren't wise. Uh, we, we, we could have accessed the shale oil and gas on a much more wiser and longer term. But when you start pumping shale, shale oil and gas that has a 80 plus percent decline rate in three years, if you don't continue to produce, produce more and more of it, then it just falls off a cliff. So it's like a lie. When you start lying, you have to keep lying. With shale, oil, and gas, to build production, you have to continue to increase production quicker and quicker, or it will decline. It's it, it'll, it'll decline quicker than you're producing. And what does that do? You know, when you have supply and demand, also as indicators or forces on the price of, of a good or a service or a commodity, it, it pushes the price down. So the, yeah, I, I we didn't, we, we don't have any plan B for long term. It's a predicament. I, I believe we're facing an energy, falling energy return on investment predicament, Carrie, that there isn't a solution. How we deal with this as it unfolds is a different thing, but we don't have a, a solution to how to run everything for another 50, 100 years. We, we just have to figure out how would do we respond to what's going to happen with the energy and what investments are good to be in. And to me, gold and silver are stores of economic energy, but that's where you yeah. want to be in. You don't want to be in most S, most stocks, bonds, or real estate, because as we all know, they get the value based on net present value, which mm -hmm. is burning energy in the future. They get their value in the future by earnings in the future. And if oil production is declining, then the values of these assets are going to fall. So why would investors want to stay in, in investment assets like that if they're going to continue to fall where gold and silver will hold their energy, economic energy store value? Yeah, very true. Well, I see your point and I think there's some validity to it. Got to do some more research and find out more about this. But if people want to find out more about what you're doing, I've seen your work on the oil drum, I think oil drum, oilprice.com. And uh, where else do we find you these days? Carrie, you can go to the srsrockreport.com. I put out two or three articles a week. And I just started my YouTube channel because I found out uh, you doing uh, charts and explaining them, uh, discussing them with a pointer, it, it helps understand the principles, the uh, the fundamentals better. And so I'm, I'm, I'm putting out one or sometimes two new videos a week. So if they can go to the uh, SRS Rocco YouTube channel and subscribe there, uh, I, I put out interesting videos on these concepts and how things are going to unfold in the future. All right. Hey, well, got a question for Steve, myself, be part of the show. Send an email to kl at kerrylutz.com. Totally know what you're talking about. When you're talking numbers, you can't be doing podcasts. Unfortunately, that's what I've learned. It's you can throw out two or three numbers. That's it. Uh, and the Twitter feeds at Kerry Lutz. The Facebook page is Financial Survival Network. And Steve, been a pleasure. We'll talk to you again real soon. Thank you, Kerry. FSN Radio. It's all about what's next. Go to FinancialSurvivalNetwork.com and sign up for your free weekly newsletter. You'll also get three free reports. The Financial Survival Network. It's all about what's next.